So I'm delighted this morning to be with Gavin Gallagher and Jack Jiggins. Now, um, I, I, I reached out online in October or November, and uh, I have to admit, I wasn't expecting Gavin to, you know, pop into my comment section. I said, I'm, I've got an event, a commercial uh, summit coming up. Uh, I'm open to speakers. And, you know, uh, Gavin, you know, blew my mind away. I, I don't meet many people doing office parks uh, whatsoever. It's not in my forte whatsoever in terms of who I'm connected to. So really delighted, Gavin um, Gallagher from Ellsport. Do you call it Ellsport? Sorry? It's Earl's Fort. Earl's Fort. Earl's Fort group, yeah. <clears throat> so I've been to the um, site, the development site, uh, 9,000 employees on site, 40 acres, 50 tenants plus. Gavin can explain the demographics better than I can. Um, but Jack, um, rather than me hogging the air, um, over to you. Thanks, Brendan. And uh, good morning, Gavin. Good morning. Um, I mean, what what a great uh, opportunity we have for you coming over for the uh, the commercial summit. Um, so I'm involved in commercial property. I currently have a few commercial properties, and I believe it's a, a few tenants and probably uh, across about thirty to forty individuals. Um, and that that is that is growing. But I also manage a portfolio which has five tenants with 150 individuals. So I'm key to learn and I'm starting from where you've obviously started many many moons ago and all the learns, learnings and takings and mistakes that you've made to get to your 9,000 individuals on your on your commercial site so I'm certainly going to have my my notepad ready on the day and really keen to to absorb everything I can from you and and, and all your learnings um, but obviously you're you're coming over here to share your journey and and what are you mainly going to be talking about on the day of the 7th of March well, that's a good question. I've actually been giving that a lot of thought lately because normally the audience that I'm speaking to uh, are corporate occupiers. And so I'm, I'm dealing with CEOs and uh, real estate teams and things like that. And I get the impression from uh, speaking with Brandon and the various people he's connected me with that it's more an audience like yourself, um, people who are in commercial or want to get into commercial uh, or want to expand and grow their portfolio in the commercial space. And I've gone through a very uh, varied career. I started out as an architect and uh, I went through a, my father died when I was young. So at the age of 21, I had to step into sort of his shoes and I started working with some cousins that he had built. He'd start building East Point with back at that time. But I, I kind of, I've always been entrepreneurial in nature and uh, I, was, I was always kind of doing, you know, starting little businesses when I was in school and in college and things like that. And I kind of bristled at the idea of working under somebody. So I went and I built my own portfolio in my personal name uh, on a much smaller scale and started to sort of scale that up. And um, one of the things that I was started out with was a small, uh, commercial center. Uh, what, what we had in Ireland at the time, uh, I, I guess it's pretty much everywhere in the UK as well, is where you build a scheme of apartments over shops. Yeah. And um, I think in America they call them a strip mall, but it's, it's kind of like a neighborhood center, you'll call it. Yeah. And so there was actually a, an opportunity. It, I didn't actually, I was not the developer in this case. And there was, a, there was a builder who had built, I think, 60, 65 apartments. And there was four shop units on the ground floor. And part of the planning permission obligation was to build these shop units. But the guy was an apartment builder. So all he wanted to do was build 65 apartments and sell them and make his profit on that. And he saw these shop units as this kind of irrelevance and this kind of irritation for him. So I kind of came along and I looked at it and I just, I thought, okay, I think he's designed these things wrong. He had one shop unit that was 4,500 square feet. And it's the, it's the kind of thing that you might put a, a carpet showroom or something like yeah. that, you know? And it was in this sort of busy uh, part of Dublin. And, uh, and I remember kind of thinking, God, well, why did he build it so big? I mean, it, you know, you'd get smaller units in there. So I think I paid, um, I think I paid 1.1 million 
for this large unit. And what I did was I divided it. I went and I got a subsequent planning permission to subdivide it into three smaller units. So one of them was 1,200 square feet, one of them was 800 square feet, and one of them was whatever the balance was. Still pretty big. Yeah, they're, they're, they're a reasonable yeah. size, but it was more akin to what you'd rent easily in that yeah. kind of area. Yeah. And, uh, and so I found a, uh, a convenience, not a convenience, uh, like a wine merchant that was doubled up as an off license. And I find a, a bookies. So there was the likes of Paddy Power bookmakers and all of these kind of guys that were interested. And then there was a pizza store, uh, one of these pizza places like Domino's or whatever. And I put it out there, I divided it up and I put it out there and these things filled up pretty quickly. And I'd say my total time involved with the planning and everything was maybe one year. And at the end of the year, I put it all up for sale and I cleared 3.7 million on that investment. Wow. And wow. It was, it was just a complete, I, I mean, I knew I was going to make a profit, but I had no idea it was going to be that kind of profit. Yeah. And I remember just thinking to myself, whoa, I've, I've stumbled into something pretty good here. And in fact, what was really mind blowing is the bookie, which was the sort of 800 square feet, tiny little runt of a unit. He, he offered 1.1 million or 1.2 million for his one unit. So basically just that small little unit took the entire, paid the entire investment. Yeah. And, and then I was left with the two others. So with the profit that I had made from that, uh, there was still three other units in this development for sale. And so I bought another one and uh, I paid, I think eight, it was kind of less, it was less desirable. It was kind of around the side. And I paid, if I can remember correctly, around 780 or 800, something like that for this unit and it was quite a large unit but it was it didn't have the same profile so i didn't think it was going to do as well but along came this uh i don't know if you if you have these things in the uk probably have done loads of these different but it was it was basically it was a polish supermarket so yeah. it was a guy that had started he'd come to ireland and he basically he set up these small local food supermarkets yeah. And so there was, it's quite a large Polish community in Ireland. And this guy, he had literally queues out the door. He was so popular and wow. I had no idea. And I remember thinking to myself, Oh, you know, uh, this guy, I don't know about his covenant and this and that and the other. I was so wrong. I mean, this was, this was probably the best business of the whole lot. And, wow. um, the, the 780 or 800, we, I think I ended up selling that unit for around 1.5 million or something like that. Wow. And, uh, and, it, and it went on and on like this. And so that was the beginning of my entrance into commercial um, in my own personal capacity. Now, while that was going on, I was involved in East Point. Mm -hmm. East Point was a development at the time. So it was 40 acres of land. I hadn't been involved in the actual purchase of the land that had all taken place with my, by my father and his cousins that were working together. And, but I was there sort of now representing the family and being involved in kind of every step of the way. So it was these two, you know, large corporate on one side and then the smaller sort of retail commercial stuff on, uh, in my own personal capacity. Yeah. And I kind of, so I had, in a sense, I had the best of both worlds. I had these two sort of looking at both sides of the market simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it was a really hectic time. Um, it, you know, I bought something in the same area as the, as the development I've just been talking about. I bought a, um, a building that had, had just been vacated by one of the big banks. So it had a financial institution planning permission and financial institutions to have a special uh, permission. You don't just put it into a retail unit, it has to have a specific uh, mm -hmm. financial status. And, uh, and these sorry, guys... Sorry, Gavin. Sorry? Uh, sorry, Gavin and Jack to interrupt. Is that the same in the UK, Jack? Uh, it's A2 in the UK. So it's, it's not... It, I mean, it has its own uh, use class, but you, there are parameters which you can convert it to, to, to other uses. But a financial institution is A2. So it's similar, yeah. Similar, yeah. 
Well, this is the thing is when I, when I got involved um, in this, it's funny, it, it's all, I think one of the lessons that I've learned is that it's all about relationships. And, um, and I mean, knowing you guys and, and things like that, it's just, it's amazing the information and the kind of the small little bits of data that you can pick up here and there. And that can be super, super useful. So I have a friend who I used to go, basically I used to go water skiing with this pal of mine, but he worked in the bank. And uh, he called me up one day and he says, hey, you know, I know you're involved in this project, but um, nearby, but we're moving out of this building and uh, maybe it'd be an interesting place for you to have a look at. So it wasn't on my radar until we were chatting and he just told me about this. So I kind of started to have a look at it and I thought, wow, this could be a great conversion. Take it away from financial use and put it into maybe a large convenience store like a, a spa or one, like a, a WH Smith or something like that. So I thought, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a bid for this property. So I contacted the agents and I said, I understand this is on the market. And it was very early. They hadn't even put a for sale sign up on it yet. And uh, they were like, oh yeah, it's, you know, it's going to be on the market soon. And I said, I'd like to put in a bid. And, uh, and I got the impression right away that they didn't appreciate me coming to them so quickly. And it was a funny, it's one of those things where I started to suspect that maybe they had a preferred buyer lined up that they kind of, you know, these guys have like their, their, their favorites and stuff. And, and there was this definite impression that, oh, you know, we'll let you know when you can kind of contact yeah, us. Yeah. And I was kind of like, mm, no, I understand it's for sale and I'm making a bid. And anyway, I, I ended up kind of having a bit of a, 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 a row with this guy. And he didn't like that I was making this bid, unsolicited bid. And so I said, look, tell your client that I, here's my bid. And anyway, he told me that there was another bidder that was interested, but he didn't want to get into a Dutch auction kind of a thing. And I was kind of like saying, hold on, who, do you, <laughs> who are you working for? Are you working for the, the client or are you working for the other bidder? You know, yeah. he didn't like that at all. So we, we, didn't, get, we didn't get along <laughs> too well. And uh, anyway, as it turns out, we ended up going to this competitive bid situation. And I put in a bid that was... I think nowadays these things would be disqualified, but I said I would pay 5,000 more than, than the next highest bid up to a maximum. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said up to a maximum of, of whatever it was. I think it was 1.25 was the maximum. Um, but I think I, I offered, I said I offer 900,000, um, but in the event that there's a higher bid, I'll pay 5,000 more than whatever the bid is up to a maximum of 1.25. And that was how I kind of put this bid in and end, ended up, the guy called me up. He says, okay, Gavin, you've, you, you've been basically selected at 1.25. And uh, now I don't know whether the other guy came anywhere near that, but that was the way I, I kind of reckoned I could afford 1.25 and I wanted to get this. So paid a deposit, secured the property, went off to my bank, started speaking to them about, um, you know, borrowing the rest of the money. I'd only put down 10%. I didn't have the rest of the money to pay for this. And uh, so then I, I met my friend for lunch who had told me about it, the guy that worked in the bank. And I said, hey, you know, I've actually secured this and uh, now, and he goes, oh, well done. And he says, well, let me tell you a little bit of inside information. He says, there is a credit union in the area that was actually very interested in this branch. And, uh, but I, I don't think they can move that quickly. And, uh, and I think you probably snuck in and actually, you know, secured it before they'd even like figured out whether they wanted it or not. And he said, they might come back to you. And so I was like, oh, that's interesting. And anyway, I, I assembled a team of architects and stuff and we started working on our plans for turning this into a, uh, a convenience store. And then I got a call from an agent friend of mine and he said, Gavin, did you just secure that property that used to be the bank? And I was like, I did. He goes, I've got some good news for you. There's a credit union that we work with and they want to buy it off you. And I was like, well, it's, you know, not for sale. It's, uh, I've, uh, I'm, I've got very serious plans to turn that into such and such. Anyway, lo and behold, six weeks later, I shook hands on a deal 
and I think it was 3.7 million we sold it for six weeks after oh, wow. paying 1.2. Now, there was VAT included because it was a financial institution. About 700,000 of that was VAT, but I made it was an absolute hummer of a deal. And uh, I couldn't believe it was possible. I, I had only put down 120,000, I didn't put down 1.2 million. The bank had lent me that. So on 120,000 in investment, I was suddenly landed with you know two million profit or something like that. So it was um, it was it was pretty impressive, and I was I was kind of just taken aback by commercial property. And at that time, I was building some houses, and I was doing a couple of small residential schemes. And I just thought, let's go all in on the commercial stuff, you know, <laughs> and everything else. And and I was also involved in buying. Uh, residential property and I just remember the amount of work that goes into residential you know the tenant you know chasing them for the monthly rent and oh my washing machine is broken or this is broken or that is broken or the door is not working I can remember it was you need a whole crew to kind of mm -hmm. look after residential whereas with with a commercial property it's an FRI lease and so you don't basically have any involvement in the maintenance of it and stuff. And, and I get four checks a year for the rent and, and that cool. was it and paid in advance. Yeah. yeah. I was just thinking like, why are people looking at residential and, when this and, is the alternative? And a three month rent deposit and yeah. five to 10 year lease. And the faster the, the, the max of the matter, if they don't pay their rent, you're covered for X amount of time, you know, assuming three to six months, depending on what time they, they drop out. And you can just lock the doors and look for someone new. That's it. So from my point of view, it was a no brainer. It was just, you know, don't so stop wasting your time on the residential stuff. This commercial stuff is it's fast. You can make decisions quickly. You know, you're not dealing with people who are like, Oh, I don't know. And stuff because it's their personal property as opposed to a commercial decision, you know? Yeah. Um, so to me, it made all the sense of the world. So I got, bigger and bigger and just kept on kind of doing those kind of transactions and I started working with banks and I started becoming the preferred developer so I built a number of bank units uh, that were specifically for you know branches around the place and they were very lucrative because I was buying the land with a lease in place before I secured the land uh, like there would be an agreement to lease simultaneous simultaneously yeah and, and, I, and, I, and then I would build it out and the bank would move in um, and as long as I delivered to the specification that they required those guys and I'd have 25 year leases in some cases mm. Gav, Gavin and Jack um, in terms of any questions I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions on the day and it's a great opportunity on the 7th of March is there any key question you want to uh, ask Gavin I think we've covered a lot of ground and, and Gavin's shown the potential of commercial property. Uh, like everything that you've said, I can resonate with, but on a, on a much smaller scheme, like earlier this year, I bought a disused NHS building, found a tenant between exchange and completion and the bank lent on the new value. So I, I completely uh, uh, resonate with all of it. I suppose uh, we should probably be wrapping it up fairly soon because we don't want to give away too much content. I think Gavin yeah. just completely delivered that there's money to be made in flips, better covenants, developments, whatever it may be. It's about spotting the opportunity. The, uh, only, thing, the only thing I would say is you, you do have to be very strategic and disciplined because I, I mean, then we went into a recession a couple of years later and the recession was brutal. And uh, I've gone past some of those units that I, sold for the nice profits and stuff and uh, some of them are boarded up and they actually have you know uh, wow. to, you know to rent signs and stuff so if i had stayed in those units i'd now have an empty unit that is costing me money and so you do have to be careful about the covenant you do have to be very disciplined you also have to be careful with borrowing sums of money unless you have your secure you know, tenant lined yeah. up I did take some gambles and they didn't work out for me. I bought a property in a part of Dublin, a rough part of Dublin, um, very, very working class with, a, with quite a lot of drug problems in the area and stuff. But it was a very, very cheap unit. And I remember thinking to myself, how can I not make money on something so cheap? So I bought it and I had a tenant lined up 
right away. And it was one of these convenience stores. And those guys were um, very much, you know, very bullish about going in. And they had a designer that was kind of doing their design for their unit. And all of a sudden, a planning permission about three doors down went up for another competing uh, business. Uh, it was another convenience store. And then when they, as soon as that planning permission was put up on the wall, these guys pulled out of the deal with me. Mm. And so I didn't have a secure, even though they were doing all these, you know, things that made it seem like this was going full steam ahead. I mean, they yeah. had an architect measuring up and designing and everything like that. So when somebody has that, you assume, oh, these guys aren't going to back out. But they backed out overnight because of this other event. And five, six years later, I still had that unit sitting empty. And, uh, and, I mean, and it, was imp it was almost impossible to sell uh, because, you know, empty unit, nobody wants it. Something that's been sitting there for years, nobody wants it. So I ended up putting it into uh, the Alsops. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen Alsops, but the... Uh, here yeah. in Ireland, they used to put these big um, auctions together where they'd have 500 properties. Yeah, no, we have we have all sorts. Yeah, so that um, that was here, and they, they'd have it was during the recession. They had these huge days where five or six hundred properties would be auctioned off, and you could walk away. And I remember selling that particular property for about one third of what I paid for it, wow. even after thinking that this was a no brainer. So wow. there, there are definitely mistakes, you know, yeah. I, I don't want people going out there saying you can buy a commercial and you're just going to make buying, money. buying 1.2 million pound banks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can, you can land yourself in a, in a whole lot of headaches as well. So it, it, it takes discipline and that's something that I'm, I'm starting to put together um, some kind of um, coaching course that would actually spell out all of these lessons because I can teach you all about how to, win but then equally i can teach you how to lose because i've lost some big numbers over the years as well and uh, and it's it's trying to balance the two just to make sure that you don't go all in and uh, and not realize what your downside is yeah yeah it's so, i completely agree with that a friend of mine uh was buying a mixed use retail unit in the on the high street and he had a contract drawn up for metro bank to to, to be a tenant for 20 years uh and on signing the legals they pulled that out yeah, and that was that was the week uh, before the EU referendum. So it's, it was like, you know, very, very recent. That was Metro Bank. So, yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. It, it, it's easily stung in in, a, in commercial property. It is. And okay. Decisions are super quick. And that's that, that's one of the biggest things. Whereas a, a residential thing, people will hum and haw. But they're generally, you know, you know, if somebody's interested in the property. But with a commercial decision, the guy that you're dealing with, may not be the ultimate decision maker. It may come from his board of directors. Mm -hmm. So he might be very bullish on the idea, but suddenly a decision comes down from, a t from, from up on top. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. Actually, sorry. I was going to say, Gavin and Jack, I, I'm really delighted to have both of you on call. Delighted to have both of you at the commercial uh, summit as well. So I want to say a massive thanks to uh, Gavin, how can people reach you who aren't coming along to the summit? If there's anyone who's not coming to the summit, um, how can they reach you? I've got a, um, a, a small blog that I keep, um, Gavin J. Gallagher dot blog. Um, uh, J, J, J for James. So make sure you put the J in there. The um, Gavin J. Gallagher. And then you can find me on social media using the same. Um, I, I go under Gavin J. Gallagher for pretty much all my profiles. Brilliant. So, Gavin, I know I've cut you short. We, we could be on here for a lot longer. I just want to say a massive thanks both for your time today and your time when I came to see your site in Dublin as well. So, massive and thanks. for being a bit late coming onto the call. I, um, I had a bit of traffic problem coming in here. So, I... Did you travel by bike? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nice one there. You got me. <laughs> so mass, massive thanks and thank you to Jack as well. Thank Cheers. you. Good, good to speak, Gavin. Look forward to catching up with you on the 7th. Yes. Look forward to it, guys. That's thank be you.